Hello and welcome to Onion Unlimited, the podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Torridon. This episode was originally aired on the fantastic Two Tongues podcast. Please check out Two Tongues for other great podcasts. Welcome everyone to the Two Tongues podcast. Consider this your invitation to join Kyle and Chris on a journey through our minds. Where we explore the questions that have fascinated us for as long as we can remember. Could anarchy actually work? Does God exist? And just how did the cosmos get here anyway? Let me be the Virgil to your Dante, the Sacagawea to your Lewis and Clark. Let's take the guided tour through the dark chambers of our unconscious, seeking answers to the most important and unsettled questions of our shared existence. Ready or not, here we go. Here we go indeed. Here we go. Daniel, do you want to do you want to do you want to talk ascension or do you want to talk dreams? Uh, either. I uh, don't mind. Kyle, flip flip a coin. Which Where one? Do you ascension. Want to start? Ascension. Okay, so ascension. Okay, so I feel like I have been ascending to higher planes of spirituality or consciousness. It's quite an exciting journey. I think years ago I was. Somewhat egocentric. I wouldn't say I was particularly competitive, but there was always a, a kind of feeling of me and everybody else in my life. Mm-hmm. And then I guess around about 2004, I did a lot of thinking, a lot of meditating. I actually did a life coaching course, which uh, as part of the uh, coursework, you had to be quite brutal with yourself in terms of your personality traits and that kind of thing. Mm. And around about that time, I kind of started wake. I'd say I, it was like a waking up experience coming out of a, a kind of fog. And it was, it felt kind of a move from the physical to the spiritual. Now I'd always thought of myself as spiritual because I was religious, mm-hmm. very religious as a Jehovah's Witness, you know, I used to read my Bible and I used to go to church, Kingdom Hall. Right. I used to do all the things that you were expected of you as a Jehovah's Witness. But I wouldn't say up to that point I was particularly spiritual. I was religious but not spiritual. I kind of went from that point to there was a period of time where I was actually put out of the church because I questioned some of the uh, doctrines mm. that I, I didn't think were correct. And I got expelled, excommunica- uh, excommunicate, uh, disfellowship, mm. they call it, in the Jehovah's Witness Church. And I was out for three years, and I think those three years were the most spiritual time of my life. I spent a lot of those three years up in Scotland, up in the Highlands, I did a lot of writing, songwriting, poetry. I spoke to a lot of other people that were spiritually minded that weren't Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm -hmm. And then I did a stupid thing in 2009 for the sake of my family because as a a disfellowship Jehovah's Witness, I was being shunned by my family as an apostate, Mm. I capitulated and went back to the religion and basically said, I'd like to come back. I'll keep my mouth shut. I won't discuss any of the things that I'm not, you know, that I don't believe. I'll be a good boy. Mm. And they let me back in. And I can almost say that overnight, my spirituality felt like it evaporated. Mm. And I spent the next 10 years jumping through hoops religiously, you know, kind of attending the church services, preaching to other people, the doctrines, etc., and generally feeling quite conflicted. In my heart, I kind of knew, "Mm, you know, I don't believe this. I don't believe this is truth. So again, I kind of got very religious, but there was something missing. Now, in 2019, my, uh, my marriage ended 
Um, I wasn't happy in my marriage and um, one thing led to another and my marriage ended. I was divorced. I was kicked out of the church again and almost instantaneously after leaving the church and losing everything, I think this is important, the loss of everything I had in terms of my home, my family, my relationships, my friends, my religion, everything. I lost it all overnight because everything was connected. Right. I suddenly felt very spiritual again. And the association I made after this happening twice to me was that when you lose everything, it kind of brings, when you lose everything physical, whether it's possessions or physical relationships with people, it brings your spirituality into focus. Mm -hmm. That's that's very much how it felt. And I found myself in a position where, because I was no longer subscribed to a religion that expected certain things of me, I could then explore things that I couldn't before. For example, you know, Hinduism, Pandaism, Eastern spirituality, that kind of thing. As a Jehovah's Witness, you wouldn't be allowed to meditate, for example. Really? That, that would be prohibited. Well, you can pray, but you can't meditate? You can pray, but you can't meditate mm. because the idea is that if you clear your mind enough to lose your self, you know, your ego, mm. they have this idea that you're basically opening yourself up to wicked spirits from another realm. I know, you know a lot demons, of Christian... devils and... Yeah, I know a lot of I, non-Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, Christians, who who feel the exact same way. That like doing uh, yoga, exactly. you know, it, it opens you up oh, to the devil. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, listen. no yoga, no meditation, yeah. let's, let's nothing see, to do with chakras it, or crystals it, is, or anything like that. Isn't it isn't, all bad? Isn't it funny that the, you guys, the way you guys just described the church prohibiting uh, clearing your mind to the degree that you that you might have an enlightening experience about the nature of yourself and God <laughs> that they're prohibiting Isn't that amazing? from having mm. the religious experience. Yeah. You can, you can only go right up to it, but don't have it. <laughs> oh man. That that's exactly, that's exactly the conclusion I've come to that religion is. And, and by religion, I'm only really speaking from, from my background, which was a pseudo Christian cult effectively. It was very secular in nature. It was almost like it was a, it, it was religion, but it wasn't, it, there was no mysticism to it. There was mm. no spirituality to yes. it. Yes, yep. It was just a formula that you had to go through. That's, and that's not just Jehovah's within Witnesses. Within those, <laughs> it, well, I think within those, within those environments, whatever label you want to put on it, Christian, Jehovah's Witness, there tends to be a lot, this is my experience, there tends to be a lot of judging, a lot of selfishness, gossip, mm. competition. There's this constant, I need, I need to be uh, salvation worthy. Mm. And then that brings with it, after going through all the formulas to be acceptable to God, there, there then comes a lot of pride. Mm, yeah. with it it's i don't think it's a very nice nice um environment to be in it's certainly not a spiritual environment to be in and like i say as soon as i left that environment it was like a spiritual cap had been taken off me and the spirituality started to flow again yeah so does that does that come in the form of like being allowed to, I want to say ask questions, but ask yourself questions, being allowed to pursue ideas and paths um, that you, that trying to stay in the JW box was preventing you from being able to explore. Uh, when you say yes. cap comes off, what do you mean? How, you know, how, how would you illustrate that? Um, so within that, the Jehovah's Witness environment, you are pretty much only allowed to read Jehovah's Witness literature. Mm. Everything is very much scripted for you. So, you know, you go to two or three meetings a week where the doctrine is given to you and it's, it's, it's presented in such a way they have publications, books and magazines 
with the Jehovah's Witness doctrine in. So what you do is you read it before you go to their meeting, to their church service. When you're at the church service, someone will read it from the, from the platform. And then they will ask scripted questions oh, based no. on what you've just read. Oh, no. And then in the audience, you put your hand up and you're asked, you know, Daniel, and I would then repeat <laughs> what we've just read oh, my in the literature. And then the, the person conducting the meeting would say, yes, very good, excellent, next question. There's a lot of repetitiveness. It's kind of mind-numbing. Mm. It is brainwashing, yeah. effectively. Whereas when you leave, all of a sudden you realize, do you know what? I can actually read about, I can read the Upanishads or the Gitas, you know, the Hindu Gitas. Yes. Or I can, I can sit and meditate for an hour or I can read about chakras. All of these things are things that you would never be able to look at before. Mm. It's a very sheltered, closed life. And what, what's that experience been like? Because what, what you're describing is like coming up out of Plato's cave. That's what you're describing. And, that's, mm. and, that, and, that, is, and that is ascension, obviously. Climbing up out of the cave. You, you used to see just the shadows. Now you're approaching the, you're approaching the uh, entrance to the cave and you see the sun. And what is that? What is that experience like? You know, you when when those shackles are removed. I know you said when you had your sh first hiatus from the church, how how spiritually um, you know uh, fecund that was for you. So wh what? You one know, one word, yes. one word to that freedom. <laughs> nice, it's a big word. Absolute total freedom, freedom to think, freedom to choose. Mm. Well, now, now I understand why they can't have a guy like you around. You know, you've got that kind of manufactured, boxed in. Uh, you, they can't have people like you around asking questions. Exactly. Making people think yeah. things. Exactly. So, People yeah. like me are, um, and, and I'm not alone. There are many, many like me. There are thousands at the moment leaving Jehovah's Witnesses. The more control they try, the leadership, uh, particularly the more control they try to exert, particularly when it comes to thought control, mm. the more people are waking up to it. The sad thing I see is I would say probably 80 to 85% of people leaving religions or cults become completely atheist mm -hmm. in terms of there is not, not even so much there is no God, but the idea that there is nothing beyond the phys physical realm. Mm. Mm. And I think that's sad. I yeah. think religion has done a really a big injustice there. It's kind of killing, it's killing people's mm. innate spirituality. Yep. And they've got this, uh, this weapon of materialist science uh, once they leave to, mm. uh, you know, kind of, bash the idea that there is anything else you know like they they come out yeah i think a lot of people come out of religions because of dogma and things you know that yeah. aren't, aren't spiritual at all uh and then they mm. go out and they they start exploring their other options and like i said they come into contact with this materialist science that everything is just matter um and yep. that i think yeah that just like it is it definitely ruins people's uh spiritual capacity it did mine for a long time for sure so yep i agree yep um I want see i don't i don't think i'm going to become a hindu by any means but when i look at hinduism and buddhism eastern spirituality in general it doesn't feel to me like religion Hinduism doesn't seem so much a religion, more of a philosophy to mm. me. So I, whereas Western so-called spirituality are very much religions. Mm. I want. I don't know if that. I, I I definitely want to talk about that because I want to get into Hinduism. the The thing that comes to my mind, mm. the thing that comes to my mind, is I just I'm just getting these images that religion takes something that we would call spirituality that that you maybe you might call it something like shamanism or something like what Kyle was describing when he was talking about the sacred groves 
or so, something mm. something like uh, Stonehenge. Man, I would love to see Stonehenge. Daniel, have you seen Stonehenge? I haven't, and oh. it's so close to me. I, I need to, I need to go. <laughs> um, I, I, yeah. I, I think that there's something real about having a connection with nature and a connection with your own consciousness through the experience of nature. There's something real yeah. li like the mystic experience that's possible that, that we would call something like spirituality and it gets turned into something called religion. And it's like religion and spirituality are associated terms, but they're completely different things. And they the, are and, completely different. And there are religions that haven't gone so far astray, that are a little bit closer to the idea, to the truth um, of, of, of spirituality, and Hinduism is one of them, especially mm, I think so. Vedanta Hinduism. Yeah. Um, but but re really quickly, Daniel, I, I want to ask you a question before we get off, because this is uh, keeps popping in my head. Somebody like you, having, exp mm -hmm. having experienced the coming and going from Jehovah's Witnesses and seeing you know, the cult for what it is, and also recognizing the the brainwashing element do you do you are you more sensitive to the propaganda and political ideology you know cuz because it comes from the religious realm but it also comes from the political realm are you more sensitive to the bullshit and the propaganda and the brainwashing <laughs> that the political brainwashing yeah. that's going on absolutely <laughs> okay absolutely yeah i think i think when you've been in that environment and you wake up you you suddenly realize that the the world is full of people that want to control other people and they all follow a very similar script they generally speaking they offer first of all they create a problem yeah. um whether that uh, you're all going to go to hell or you're going to die at Armageddon or mm -hmm. they create a problem and then they sell a solution. Mm -hmm. And half the time, the problem doesn't even exist. Mm. It's not, it's not real. It's, um, I think you see that in, yeah, in politics and religion. You heard it here. First, and even in, uh, even in, even in commerce, I think you see it in h how many different products are being produced for problems we never realized we had <laughs> you know? yeah you need to buy this because oh yeah i need that you know <laughs> it's, it's funny daniel because i have a professional background in finance you know and uh, uh -huh. and in and, and economics you know um uh the 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 phrase that you often hear is that you know if you want to start a business all you have to do is recognize where there's an opportunity wherever responsibility is being abdicated that's an opportunity for a business and um I, and that and that makes perfect sense but it doesn't take into consideration the point you just made that you can solve a problem or you can invent a problem and sell the solution <laughs> which one is easier <laughs> you know that is true. Option. Absolutely. And I think as well, the um, a lot of times the problem that is invented is fear-based. Yes. They, they, you know, you, you are scared of losing out in some way, whether that's your life or your reputation or money or whatever. They, they introduce a fear, which is very often an irrational fear, and then, uh, then sell you the solution. You know, if you mm. come to our church or if you invest with us or, or if buy you this vote, product, or, or if you, you won't vote need for to our, fear anymore. Or if you vote for our party, mm. yes. Vote for our party, you won't need to fear anymore. <laughs> exactly. Everything will be fine, you know. Uh, um, boy. I think sometimes I've, I've kind of wished I hadn't had the background I've had because it's been extremely painful exiting from it and I've lost everything in terms of friendships and my children is the biggest thing. Mm. Um, I have no contact with my children anymore. And it all comes down to a difference in beliefs because I no longer believe the same things as they, they do. I'm viewed as a danger. Mm. I've wished I didn't have that background, but then at the same time, it has in some ways proved to be a blessing because I feel like I've kind of woken up to a lot of things, whereas before I was kind of walking around with, 
a blindfold on. Right. They say ignorance is bliss, don't they? They sure do. And they're not wrong. Yeah. <laughs> they're not wrong. They're, they're not, not wrong. wrong. I've sometimes I've thought I'd like to go back to having never asked any questions or, <laughs> you know, probed the edges of what seemed to be reality at the time. But I did, and I can't change that. No, I'm can't. where I am now. So You ate the apple. Yeah, yeah you ate the apple. Yeah. So uh, let's circle back to Hinduism for a second, because we were we were talking a little bit about uh-huh. about it being maybe more palatable because it comes across as a, more of a philosophical doctrine than a religious doctrine. And I think by that you mean, you know, it's less of a you have to believe X, Y, and Z or else, you know, kind of a kind of a situation. Uh, what what was it about Hinduism that appealed to you? It, uh, what what was the first thing? I mean, that what sticks in your mind, or what what was the, what were the ideas that appealed to you about it? I, I want to get your uh, okay. <laughs> Well, this, this this is this this is a tale that make you smile as well. I was so I was a Jehovah's Witness at the time. This is going back a few years now. Jehovah's Witness, and I don't know if you've ever seen the. Um, have you seen those carts uh, like trolleys that they stand with giving out literature? Uh, you, you you stand up on. They them? go down to like the town. They go down to the town center, and they'll stand there with a. It's like a trolley with loads of books and magazines oh, yeah, yeah, on it. Yeah, yes, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah? Yeah. So I used to do that every Tuesday. I used to spend eight hours standing in uh, Sheffield, one of the cities nearby. Pretty much no one was interested. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it was all part of my religion, so I did it. A guy came up to me, and he, he was a Hindu. Lovely guy. Got chatting with him. And I was just fascinated by his outlook on things. He pointed to a tree and he said, that tree is God. Yes. And then he point, pointed to a pigeon and he said, that pigeon is God. Yep. And then he pointed to me and he said, you are God. Yes. And I am God. <laughs> yes. And I was like, wow, that's profound. And he invited me to go down to, um, he had a, uh, a little stall on one of the markets a bit further down. So during my, uh, during my lunch break, I sneaked away from the Jehovah's Witnesses <laughs> and uh, I found this, this guy and he gave me a copy of the Ashtavakra Gita and I read a section of that. I'll just read it. It's very, very short. Sure. It says, um, it says, I am the infinite deep yes. in whom all the worlds appear to rise beyond all form forever still, even so am I. And I read that and I thought, wow, this infinite deep, some kind of field that 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 kind some kind of quantum field yes. is what that generated to me, like some kind of ocean. Yes. From which all the worlds appear to rise, and yet this infinite deep remains still, unchangeable, eternal. Yes. That wow, that was that was eye opening. D- Daniel, did you know that the ocean is also um, symbolic of the unconscious in in dream analysis? Mm. Mm, I think I think there's a link, isn't there? I think there is the infinite deep. That quantum- See, I've been I've been doing a lot of uh, study recently on uh, quantum fields, and the fascinating thing about it is, even when there is nothing, so if if you've got a box and you take everything out of the box, yes, literally everything, all the air, you still have what's known as a quantum field within that space. As far as we know, it's it's most likely um, uncreated. It's it's eternal. Yes. And this field, like a, a kind of wave, produces little packets of energy, which then kind of crash over each other and become particles of That's, matter. Is that vacuum energy, Daniel? So, pardon? Is that, is that what they call vacuum energy? Hmm. So it- basically, if you've, got, if you've got nothing, something will always arise from that nothing. It's amazing. And that just got me thinking that, I, I mean, I... 
I can't prove this, but I suspect that that underlying field is probably what the Hindus were speaking of when they talked about the infinite deep from which all the worlds arise. I love it. I think that that field is most likely conscious or, or has the ability to produce consciousness at least. And that is what I would think of as source from which everything comes. This is why I say I don't, I don't, I don't think when you when you look at Hinduism. I mean, I'm 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 only kind of very early uh, looking into Hinduism, but I don't think it's so much a religion as a philosophy, and I think it's very scientific. It fits it fits with what we are starting to learn about the way that quantum physics works. And that makes you wonder how they could have articulated those things that they did. Mm, it does. I mean. That's completely baffling. When it takes quantum mechanics to make sense of the Upanishads, you have to ask yourself, what in the hell is going on? That's amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, it is, it is isn't it? <sighs> so, See, I would call that true. I would call that true inspiration. Whoever, whoever wrote that was connected to something greater than themselves. Mm. Um, Absolutely. So while we're talking about the Upanishads, I have a couple that I can read to you and we can talk about if you want. Mm, um, I, I, I sent you a photo of the, of the copy of the Upanishads that I have and you were like, nope, you can't find it in the UK, period. So I'm going to read to you uh, some of the ones that I first read that blew my mind. And while I'm doing this, I also want to mention there's another book. If you haven't read, you absolutely should uh, uh, immediately. It's called The Tao Te Ching. It's the holy the holy book of the Taoist religion in China. Are you familiar with that I one? I think I'm, I think I, I think I may have just downloaded that. Okay, not so long back. You will. I'm reading a book at the moment called The Divine Matrix. So when I finish reading that, I'll I'll probably move on to that. Okay, good. I I want to ask you about the Divine Matrix also, uh, but uh, okay. but yes, it's uh, one of those things. It's very easy to read. The passages are written in a very poetic way, and I, you, I think you will appreciate. And very similar, many of the passages are very similar to the Upanishads. Um, but uh, but okay, all right. I'm going to read a couple of these for you, um, and I would love to be able to pronounce the. Uh, um, the, the the names of the Upanishads, but I'm not even going to try. So uh, I'll just I'll just preface this by saying the first thing I learned about um, Hindu beliefs that kind of struck me as powerful is an idea that's really not unfamiliar, and I don't know why it would have made such an impact on me. It's the idea that that there's a, a spiritual essence behind everything, and the spiritual essence behind you, your soul. Um, is called mm. is called Atman in in uh, mm. Hinduism, and then the spirit the the grander God version the the thing behind the cosmos is something called Brahman. So you've got Atman and you've got Brahman. It's like the personal soul, the individual soul, and then the universal soul. And when you die, or when when you're born, or when you die, you're basically being recycled. Your soul, your Atman, goes in and out of Brahman, in and out of Brahman. It goes into mm. Brahman and into the world, into Brahman, into the world. That sort of thing. Uh, so that's the idea of, of reincarnation, in, in, you know, in a nutshell. And um, the idea that there was this connection between your soul and God, that idea blew my mind. You know, it's like as a Christian, you're taught you have a soul, you have a spirit, and it's holy, and it's the thing that causes you to be alive. But never does anybody say it's also the thing that God is. Nobody ever says that. And that's that's the part that makes the hair stand up on my arms. Mm -hmm. Um by the way, Daniel, if that that Hindu gentleman that introduced you to the Upanishads and said, that, you know, the bird is God and you're God, if he would have said that to me, especially when I was a teenager, <laughs> I, I I'm just picturing. I don't know if what you guys have in the UK, but in the United States, we have these uh, these people that will hang out at uh, uh, shopping malls or public places, and they're recruiting for the military, and their job is to make the military sound really awesome to a bunch of teenagers so that they will blindly sign up. Uh, that that happens here, and that's what it reminded me of. If that Hindu man would have came up and said, the, the bird is God and you're God, I would have been stoked. I would have been following him to the ashram. I would have, I would have been on my web and shaving my head. <laughs> okay. All right, so all that, all that leading up to this. So here we go. Um, 
here's the uh, couple of Upanishad passages. First one goes like this. One should meditate on mind as Brahman. Okay, so Brahman you can think about as God with a capital G. One should meditate on mind as God. Okay, it doesn't get any more pan-psychic or, or, or pandeistic than that. Meditate on mind, on your consciousness as God. As God, I am. Exactly. All right. Here's the next one. The next one, it's, it goes like this. He is a wise man who sees all beings in, in his own self, and his self in all beings, thus realizing the unity of existence. Wise is the man who sees all beings in his own self and his self in all beings. That's the oneness. That's the oneness that, that the mystic experience describes. Here's another, Daniel. He who understands vidya, and that means the changeless reality, and avidya, yes. th that means the universe. So I'll read that again. He, hmm. he who understands the changeless reality and the universe, both together conquers death through the knowledge of the world and attains immortality through the knowledge of God. And that makes the hair... That make that... Oh, yeah. That <laughs> make that makes the... Uh, gives me goosebumps. I got them too, man. I think our goosebumps are quantumly entangled because I've got them too. <laughs> um, oh, I never got that feeling from religion. <laughs> Well, there, there you have it. This is, this is on another level, isn't it? Absolutely. At, at the same time, though, Daniel, let me, let me do this to you. Let me do this to you. That last part where he said, through knowledge of the world and attains immortality through knowledge of God, mm -hmm. achieves immortality through knowledge of God. Now, I'll read you another passage. This one's from Timothy. And which now has been manifest through the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Or the book of Revelation, which says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. So you have a promise of conquering death that you hear in the Bible. And when you compare it to the Upanishad, who promises that knowledge of God will allow you to conquer death, then I start to think about my own uh, religious background a little bit differently. Then I'm thinking to myself, maybe there was something to this, these, these biblical passages that I didn't see. What do you think? I, I agree. So when I was a Jehovah's Witness, it was drummed into me that we were the only organization on earth that understood the Bible or could interpret it. All the mysticism was sucked out of it. Mm. Everything was kind of explained to be describing the organization I was in. Once you leave that environment and you can start looking at the Bible in a different light, mm -hmm. allowing the Bible to interpret itself rather than the doctrines and the dogma, there are, I think there's some very mystical passages in, uh, in the scriptures. Oh, absolutely. Um, and and I, I did not appreciate that when I had when I had my first mystic experience back in 2019, I saw things mm. I saw things so differently for the first time. And, and in fact, what comes to my mind, and I wanted to talk about this in a different uh, context, but the story of uh, the story of Jesus um, being baptized by John the Baptist, and it's just really short. It goes like this. This is in Matthew three. It says, "When Jesus came up out of the water, heaven was opened." And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And then a voice saying, this is my own son. All right, so you've got this mythical story. Real quick, just one, two sentences, and it paints this beautiful picture. And you can imagine all these Renaissance paintings of this picture of Jesus being baptized by John the Baptist and coming up out of the water. And I would have read that and thought, that's a flowery, you know, poetic way of trying to make this this metaphorical point in this in this gospel it has nothing it has something to do with manipulating the people reading it, it has nothing to do with spirituality then i have a mystic experience and it feels like the spirit of god coming out of the sky like a dove and saying to me you are you are my own you know so that that's sort of along the well, same, the same lines as what you just said it's like uh, go ahead yeah well this is interesting because 
You know, um, Christians speak of, or many Christians speak of the born again experience. Yes. Where they receive the Holy Spirit of God and they are born again and become a child of God, etc. Um, within the Jehovah's Witness Church, they they do believe that, but they believe it's a very limited number of their membership that that get that experience. They uh, interpret the uh, the Revelation scripture where it talks of 144,000 bought from mm. the earth. Mm. They say there are only 144,000 Christians. And you are one of them, that right? Receive. Well, for the most part, Jehovah's Witnesses are not. I mean, there's 8 million of them, and they say in all time there's only ever been 144,000 of these anointed ones. All of the leadership, interestingly, claim to have had born-again experiences, but to me they seem extremely unspiritual people. Mm. 2004 when I had my spiritual awakening, that was the only framework I knew. Um, I didn't know what was happening to me. Things were opening up to me in the scriptures, in the Bible, um, in, in other uh, spiritual literature. And I interpreted that at the time as being born again as a Christian as a child of God, becoming one with Christ, one with Christ's body, and so forth. And as a Jehovah's Witness, I pretty much lived my life believing that, which wasn't very popular because it kind of put you kind of in a very small, almost elite mm, group. Yeah. You know, these anointed ones or born-again ones were kind of to be looked up to as, as kind of... Um, almost quite special but i didn't really fit the fit the profile because I, on one hand i was saying i've had this spiritual experience and i think i'm born again and but then i was questioning all their doctrines and being a danger a danger to uh, their society mm. i would say now it was a born again experience very much so it was a spiritual awakening but i don't think it's limited to christianity nope I not. think Christianity is just, if you really get the sense of Jesus and what he was on about, you know, the oneness, all his disciples being one and so forth, I think I think that's one way to attain spiritual awakening, but it's available from so many other places as well. Agreed. So I don't, I don't, view, I don't view it so narrowly now as purely a Christian experience. Yeah, that's uh, that's big. I think the important thing is that it's in there. You know, um, it's there for people to find. You know, people. Yeah. Um, not everyone's going to, um, but I think that there are a lot of Christians who they're they still have a lot of the dogma aspect of the religion. But I think that there are a lot of Christians who are really close to that, who kind of do, you know, understand like. Um, you know, you were talking about how in the JW culture, uh, you know, you're not allowed to ask questions. You're not allowed to, to do anything. Uh, my family has been a part of churches where, well, one church in particular, um, where, you know, me in the height of my atheist, materialist, uh, you know, whatever, they were still happy to have me there. Um, and, you know, I could... I could challenge whatever I wanted to. I mean, you know, I'm sure within, within reason, reason. <laughs> but I'm a pretty polite guy, so I'm not going to go, you know, you, you know what I mean? I'm not going to go out of my way to be offensive to them if they're not being uh, inappropriate to me. Uh, but, you know, they do, they're pretty open. Um, and I, yeah, I don't know. I, I, w I don't think that I would have thought that a few years ago. I just thought that it was all. It was all bullshit. It was all stupid. Um, and you couldn't, there was no truth really to be had in there aside from like, you know, your basic moralistic yeah, you know, type of yeah, stuff that yeah. Christianity is good for on some level, you know? Mm. I've, I've met quite a few Christians that are non denominational. Mm -hmm. The ones I've met that tend, when I, when I say, what religion do you belong to? They say, oh, I don't. I am just a Christian. Mm. That, that kind of minimalistic, view of christianity they seem to me to be a lot more switched on 
it's the ones that are heavily into a particular religion mm, that yes. seem to lose their way. See, I think think you're sensitive to that. Mm. Um, I, I think that's related to that episode that, that of the Onion Unlimited podcast where you said, "Look, I'm 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 not a Jehovah's Witness anymore, but but I'm also not an XJW. Don't put me in a don't put me in a in a group. Don't yeah, put don't me put in me box. in a box. That was exactly. a good one. <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, See, so the thing is, well, the, the minute you introduce religion into the picture and a church, it comes with a lot of baggage, doesn't it, in terms of their particular interpretation of scripture or their particular rituals mm -hmm. or their particular beliefs. And mm -hmm. it's, I think that runs a risk of then losing the purity mm. yes. that is perhaps in the gospel accounts, for example. Mm -hmm. Something I've said for a long time is that I mean, it makes, I, I think even when I was at the height of my atheist period, I, the idea of people believing in God didn't really bother me that much. It's just like the more claims and like baggage you start putting on it, the less likely I am to believe. It's like you're being too specific. You're making way too many claims about this thing. That's it. <laughs> that when you yeah. start, when you talk to people who are like spiritual and you ask them a question, they're like, I don't know. I have no idea. You know, it's like beyond me on some yeah, level. That's more honest. That's yeah. more honest. Yeah. Honesty. Yeah. That's it. Good. Yeah. yeah. All right, you want you want more quotes from the Upanishads? Fine with me. D Daniel. Yes, please. Daniel, I've got a couple that I can I can actually show you a little bit of the contrast between the Upanishads and the Tao Te Ching, maybe to get your uh your interest to pique your interest. So I was talking a little mm. bit a little bit about hey. Atman being the personal soul and Brahman being the, uh, the the universal soul. So it goes like this. The Atman moves and it moves not. It is far and yet it is near. It is within all beings and it is also outside of them. Okay, that, That's the Upanishad. And I think this is something similar from Taoism. It goes like this. This is why it is called the form of the formless, the image of nothingness. Meet it, and you do not see its face. Follow it, and you do not see its back. <laughs> what do you think? Mm. You're within and without. Yes. That's the idea with that, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. It's what I call the union of opposites, the Ouroboros. That's this is that's touching on fractalism again. Yes. The idea that yes. we're, we're like fragmented instances of, the whole. Yes. This guy gets The it. Divine Matrix touches on that a little bit, actually. Oh. The Divine Matrix. Mm. That's a... Who, who wrote that book? Uh, I just... I mean, it's no big deal. I was just curious if it's anybody whose name that I know. Uh, but you talked about that it, book earlier. Uh, you yeah. said you wanted to talk to him about uh, it? Uh, yeah. If this, if this is a good time to squeeze it in, uh, absolutely. I did want to ask you about it. The basic idea, there is a grid that runs throughout the entire universe so the physical universe that, that we think of what we think of as reality think of it in terms of a kind of grid of various points how small those points are i'm not sure but i, I would imagine you're talking quark size mm. and the idea is that every point in the universe is connected directly to every other point mm. in the universe. So y if you were to go from A to Z, you wouldn't have to go from point A to point B to point C to point D. You can just go from A to Z okay. because they're directly connected. A is connected to Z. It's connected uh, okay. to Y. It's connected to W. It's okay. connected to C. And that kind of matrix, that grid is woven throughout the whole universe. It explains things like quantum fields. So this idea that this grid is kind of a field that is ag that you know waves are agitated, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that's where physical matter arises from. Mm. It also explains things like spooky action at a distance, for example. Yes, where you get to um, particles that were Entangled. together at one point, yes. split them if you change the spin on one, it immediately changes the spin on the other. Yep. It accounts for things like 
uh, astral projection, consciously being able to move to any point in the universe. That's cool because um, I want I want that to be real. <laughs> <laughs> like that's so cool. Mm. <laughs> it's by a guy called uh, Greg Braden. Okay, and when you read it, it is very similar wording to what you were just reading from the Upanishads. Oh, interesting. One section talks about DNA in a human body. If you affect a DNA, whatever one of those is, if you affect a DNA, it doesn't just affect that DNA. It affects all of the DNA in the body. Yes. And that isn't something that kind of takes time to travel to other parts of your body. It's instant. If you change the DNA in a person... Their entire DNA is different. And they've done some experiments where they actually removed a DNA strand from a from a person, separated that DNA strand by a couple of hundred miles, and then did some experiments on the person that would have physical effects on the DNA of mm. that person. Obviously, the DNA in the person was being affected, but apparently this experiment proved that the DNA at a distance also was affected. <laughs> That's amazing. That That's pretty amazing. good, isn't it? It's called, uh, the subtitle is uh, Bridging Time, Space, Miracles and Belief. Mm. <laughs> that is interesting. It would explain, I, I read a book a while back by a uh, an Indian doctor. I don't know if you've ever read it, called Phantoms in the Brain. No. No, it's about uh, amputees. Mm. And uh, there was a guy that uh, went into hospital and had his arm amputated. After the operation, he could still feel his arm. And he said it felt like it was wriggling almost with like worms or maggots or something. Whoa. And the doctor said, well, it's not, it, it, you know, that that's not, not going to be, you know, the situation. It's just in your mind. And he he asked them what had happened to his arm. And they said, well, when we amputate parts, we incinerate them. And he said, "Uh, I don't think my arm's been incinerated. So the doctors checked and something had gone wrong on that day. The incinerator wasn't working or something. And uh, his arm had been bagged up and buried in the hospital grounds. Oh, my God. And when they dug it up, it was... um, it was crawling with maggots. Oh, my goodness. And um, they burned the arm, incinerated it, and all of these feelings in this guy disappeared. That's weird. That is weird. Wow. <laughs> Listen, I, isn't that, that's I'm, good, isn't it? Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm generally... My, uh, Dr. Ramakandram. Okay. I'm, I'm generally very skeptical about stuff like that, and that, that's also something I wanted to talk to you about. Um, but I will, hmm. I will tell you this story while we're talking uh, fantastic stories. Um, as far as as far as supernatural, unexplainable stuff that's ever happened to me, it, it's a very limited. You know, I, I wouldn't even put like the mystic experience in that category. I'm talking about um, seeing you know seeing ghosts or or anything any any unexplainable kind of thing like that. Um, I had I had a, a well. Uh, I don't know how specific to be here. There was somebody I knew once upon a time that um, that would write in her sleep. She would write things in her sleep, and she the reason she would she would wake up and find the writing. That's how she knew she was doing it, but she didn't have any memory of writing in her sleep. So, at one point, she shows me a piece of writing, and it was on a piece, small piece of paper, and there was a phrase written on it in cursive with no spaces in between the words. So the whole thing was written, the whole sentence was written as one continuous... Cursive word. Cursive word, yes. She has no memory of writing it. I can't remember exactly what was on this page, but what happened was about a year later, I was reading the Divine Comedy, Dante's Divine Comedy, and I, mm-hmm. and I read that passage from the Divine Comedy. That's crazy. And I, I found that piece of paper, I compared it to the Divine Comedy passage, and it had some word differences, but it was almost identical. Almost identical. And here's the strange part. The, the person who wrote this 
has zero interest in religion, had zero interest in the Divine Comedy, would have no idea who Dante was, you know, not somebody who you would ever expect. Uh, I don't know how you explain that, Daniel, but that's that's one example. I, I would say that comes back to the fact that we are all one. Mm. I, hon- I honestly do believe there is just one consciousness that is being experienced through multiple entities. Mm. We share the same consciousness. So we've all read the divine comedy. Exactly. We've all read the divine. We've all written the divine comedy. Ooh, <laughs> I love it. I love it. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Um, hold on. I got a couple more Upanishad passages before we get off this subject. Listen to this one. By pure mind alone can it be understood that there is no difference between Brahman and the manifested universe. Through mind alone can it be understood that there's no difference between God and the universe. And then this one... It's the uh, it's the divine matrix, the grid. The grid. The quantum, the quantum field is God. That's it. Uh, when Kyle and I talk about it on the podcast, we usually call it the... Uh, what do we call it, Kyle? We call it the... Uh, the, sure the Terminator Two. Oh yeah. The Terminator Two substance. Uh, I don't know if you remember that movie, but the villain from <laughs> Terminator Two. He, he was that liquid metal that could become anything. It's that pure potential that's that's behind yeah. reality. All right. This yeah. here, here's one. This one. This one's short and sweet and really good. This Atman is Brahman. This Atman. He, he's saying I am God when he says this Atman is Brahman. Yeah. And that makes the hair stand up on my arms. That's fractal again. Yes. What we are is, uh, as individuals, is small versions of the 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 greater whole, the Brahman. But there's essentially no difference. Yes. If we were Brahman, we would feel the same. I'm just nodding over here. I'm nodding in agreement. Mm. Um, here, listen to this one, Daniel. This is from the Mundanka Upanishad. It says, As a spider emits and withdraws a web, as plants grow from the soil, and as hair grows over the human body, so does the universe spring out from the eternal Brahman. That's good. I like that one. That's good. Yeah. Oh, boy. Okay. I won't bore you. I've got more, but I won't bore you with them. You said you had a um, quote by... Henry Bergson. Yes, yes. Let's let's read this one. So I, I have to say, you, um, you remember earlier when I referenced um, on Twitter sending you that uh, that uh, invite thing for that that doctor that was going to speak about psychedelics and consciousness. Um, I yeah. I actually heard about Henri Bergson from him on Twitter, and he posted this uh, passage. And since I, I've bought a couple of Henry Bergson's books, I haven't got into, but I'm going to. But here's here's how it goes goes like this. The question why anything exists presumes that reality fills a void, that underneath being lies nothingness. This presupposition is pure illusion, for the idea of absolute nothing is like that of a square circle. All right, Daniel, go. Go. Um, that comes back to the quantum vacuum again, the fact that there never is any. There is- there never is nothing. Yes. There can't be nothing. Yes. Yes. Couldn't agree more. And that idea that idea of vacuum energy that you brought up earlier, that you could suck everything out of a space, and as, as much as possible, you can remove everything from a space. And when you do that, you're still left with this quantum field that produces vacuum energy. You can never get rid of it. That there is no such thing as nothing. And at some point, if agitated enough, it will produce particles. Amazing. Amazing. There's a guy called Neil Donald Walsh. Hey. I don't know if, uh, he's written a series of book called, uh, books called Conversations with God. Okay. Where he, he speaks with God in these books. It's kind of a, I think he's a, he presents himself as a channel. Something I read the other day, it said uh, the soul... The soul is the universal life energy focused and localized 
and vibrating at a particular frequency in one specific time and space. Mm, yes. I, I love so that. even the soul, the consciousness is a is something that arises from that quantum field. Mm. So in, in I think mm. this I think this may be string theory, but I'm not a hundred and I'm not a I'm not a physicist. Mm. But the the idea that uh I think it's connected to string theory that the vibrations of the strings determine what what particle is being yeah. produced. So if it vibrates this way, it's a quark. If it vibrates this way, it's a you know gluon or whatever. Okay. Um, and that yep. and that there's some parallel there to what the what you're describing. That if if there is this quantum matrix of potential of consciousness, um, and all it takes is movement, all it takes is the vibration of that, the manipulation of that field. Uh, well, let's call that field consciousness. And who's doing the vibration? That's consciousness, baby. So on both sides. But but a certain pattern of vibration is going to create a cosmos. It's going to create a Daniel, a Kyle, a Chris. Um, there's a parallel there that you see in quantum mechanics that I, I, again, I, I, it's a, it's one of those fractal repetitions. You know, it's a it's so beautiful that idea. I don't know if it's true, but it's so beautiful. Well, this is just now. You were saying, you know, you're not sure whether you buy into the, uh, you know, the heebie-jeebie stuff. <laughs> I, I was discussing this with my girlfriend recently. So she's into crystals. She's doing a course on forensic healing, so energy healing, chakras, all this kind of thing. And on the surface, it all sounds very magical and mumbo jumbo ish. Yes, but in discussing, I mean, she's way more ahead of. She's got a natural affinity to this sort of thing. She actually views many of these things as scientifically explainable. It all comes back to the quantum field, the energies that are flowing through the universe. So, you know, when you when you speak about things like the spooky action at a distance mm -hmm. and amputees' arms and all these sort of things, there's a, there's a, a scientific explanation to it. It's not, it's not quite so strange as it seems on the surface. Would you say under that lens that somebody like, um, you know, the ancient pagan, you know, Celts or something over in your neck of the woods mm. uh, going out and doing their ritual magic, do you think that they were tapping, that they were also tapping into the quantum fields through their consciousness, perhaps as the bridge? I think, I think they probably were, yeah, because you think about what they were doing. I mean, they were, a lot of these people were in nature. They were most likely using some psychedelics of some kind, mm. I would imagine. Um, they're definitely smoking something, weren't they? They were indeed. <laughs> yeah, I, I would have said they're probably connecting to some some kind of universal consciousness or field. Absolutely. Hmm. I think I think when you look at any of the kind of mystics and sages and prophets, visionaries, all those kind of people that have come before us, they're... Um, all of them are connecting into something on a, on a higher level. They all basically say the same thing, don't they? Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? Mm. Yeah. Whether it's Jesus or Buddha or... I mean, you compare like Buddha and uh, Jesus, the amount of things that they said that were almost identical is For the sure. golden rule is something that runs through all spiritual practices, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. It's, that's interesting. So I, I think that at the the core, the root of all religious experience, of all spiritual spirituality, you might say, and religion, is is an experience. It's either somebody having a a mystic experience or something akin to a mystic experience um, firsthand, uh, or then somebody who's had one trying to explain it to other people, and that's what holy books are. That's what uh, you know, do dogma and ritual are. It's trying to reenact and recreate some experience that somebody else had. Um, and that, that might be a good way of describing that divide I was trying to describe earlier between legitimate spirituality and religion, you know? It's like the, the spirituality is... I, th I think, I think what's, what's happened, I mean, if you go back to... 18th, 19th century, even as early as that, ideas like the panpsychism that you've been talking about, you know, that all is mind, it was pretty much the default position 
even in the West, mm. you know, not just in Eastern spirituality, but even in the West. When we entered the 20th century, there was a rise in the idea that things are only true if you can directly observe them or, or give some kind of logical proof for somebody else to have the same experience. So th these sort of ideas have kind of dropped out of favour, haven't they? But I, I don't... I, I don't accept that. I don't accept that. I, I think intuition is still a very viable route to truth. I really do. I yes. don't think you can prove everything to other people. It is very much down to an experience. Yes. If you've had the experience, that's your truth. You I know, really do think that. You know, Daniel, that, that's something that I only learned a few years ago. Uh, it wasn't until I had that mystic experience in 2019, because what happened was I started to think more visually after I had that mystic experience. I started to think more in images and, and less in hard and true and firm and fast ideas. And it allowed me to think more yep. more flexibly than I ever had before. And it, it. It, yep. it, and it made me realize all kinds of things, but mostly th things that I was wrong about. Like I had previously presumed that things were more structured and rigid than they are. And then I had that experience and realized, oh no, there's a way, there's way more give to, to, to things. There's, there's, you know, it, 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 it allowed me to think more creatively and uh, it's been really great for me actually. And it also, yeah. allowed, it also allowed me to get over some of the objections that I used to have that said, if you couldn't prove something scientifically, that it wasn't worth exploring or it could be written off or it had to be written off. And then I realized after having a mystic experience that no, intuition is a legitimate sense, you know, it's a legitimate sense mm -hmm. and it tells you if you're resonating with the truth. And I just didn't know what that would even Absolutely. meant. Absolutely. And I think the only people that would disagree with that are people that haven't had the experiences. Bingo. Mm. Bingo. And some, sometimes, unfortunately, the, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm not against science at all. I think science is, is an absolutely brilliant route to finding truth. But if that, if you, if you decide that that is your only way to finding truth, things that can be replicated through experiments and proven to other people, you've immediately gone and shut off mm. a whole other science, haven't you? Absolutely intuition yeah absolutely uh, all right so uh, with our with our la with our last remaining few minutes here i want to ask you about dreams for two reasons first of all firstly i'm very interested in dreams always have been uh, always like hearing other people's dreams and trying to psychoanalyze them you know as an amateur um, so <laughs> so you said you've been getting better at remembering them writing them down i have yeah yeah i mean i i have an absolutely fantastic dream life Nice. I, I would love you to come and join me in my dream. <laughs> um, it's, I mean, they're on a, I, I think they're on a level with psychedelic experiences, to be honest. And I've started getting way better at remembering my dreams. What I'm doing now is when I wake up, I immediately uh, write it down, uh, what I've just dreamt about. I think if you leave it for even a short period of time, the dream just kind of fades yes, and you can't even remember what happened. Whereas if you write it down immediately, it kind of keeps it there. And I've actually started a uh, dream journal nice. uh, on my Onion Unlimited website. Oh, okay, great. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's really, it's really out there. <laughs> <laughs> some really weird stuff going on. Um, I keep getting some really repetitive dreams as well a place that i used to work at uh, an airport that i used to work at i fly a lot i do an awful lot of flying <laughs> interesting in my dreams and my girlfriend actually uh, interprets my dreams for me Ooh. so uh, i tell her what my dreams are each morning and um, she uh, spends a bit of time going away and 
figuring out what it all means. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take a crack at it right now, really quickly. Go on. Dream interpretation. Okay, so you, you just said you were dreaming about uh, flying an awful lot. Mm -hmm. I imagine in different contexts. Fine. And my mind yep. my mind immediately went to ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. So if you've ever seen the ones that that are supposed to uh, represent parts of the soul, one of them is a face with wings. So it's the part of you that that can f flee your body, it can fly away your your, your consciousness, you know. Um, mm. So I'm thinking about you. Well, I'm thinking about birds, like like the Great Flood, right? And they, Noah Noah sends out the birds, and they're out flying around trying to find purchase, and they come back if they can't find purchase. So these are the images that are flowing through my head while you're describing that, and I just wonder if that has something to do with feeling like you're like you're out at sea and you're looking for your solid ground. From what I've uh, been able to make of it so far, a lot of the dreams that I'm experiencing are working through some of the trauma and loss. I think that that seems to be a way that my mind is is kind of piecing things together there. And the things like flying and uh, yeah, I do a lot of that. Seems there seems to be a theme coming through with a lot of my dreams that I'm ascending in some way. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, spirit, it, it seems to be about freedom, you know, the, the freedom to to think and explore and, and that kind of thing. Uh, and I'm like just, it. I'm only just starting to get good at lucid dreaming. Yeah. Only just started on that. So, okay, well, hold on. I actually, pump, pump the I can actually know that I'm dreaming. Let, tell me about the first time that happened. The first time you noticed that you were dreaming and didn't, and didn't wake up. Uh, I realized I was, uh, I was in a sweet shop in my dream. <laughs> And I realized it was a dream, and I could pretty much make any sweets I wanted. And that's what you did? And that's what you did? You <laughs> sat there and made sweets? Yeah. Uh, I was like, you know, the sweets on offer, I don't really fancy any of these, but I can just kind of, it's a dream. I can do whatever I want. But I do, I, see, I honestly do think that dreams are another reality. I mean, something is clearly going on in your brain at the time, and it's like, Especially with lucid dreams, you're generating your own reality using your either your consciousness or your subconsciousness. Mm. And although it may be more fanciful, you know, you can break the laws of physics. I wonder whether that's any less real than our waking lives. It certainly seems real when you're in a really good dream. Sure does. You know what? I, you know what I would say. You know, you would say that your dream world is a projection of your mind, and I would say I would say exactly what you just said in in those words. I would say what what is to say that reality, waking reality, is not a projection Ooh. of our minds? Who's to say that we're not asleep? Who's to say we're not asleep? <laughs> <laughs> So d we could be the we could be the dream of the uh, the Brahmin. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Mm. Now, Daniel, do you feel like your uh, your girlfriend's um, interpretation of your dreams has that been insightful? Yeah, it has. It has actually, and it's um, it's quite interesting seeing what she makes of them. And uh, I do want to I do want to leave you with one of these quotes, and this is um, yeah. this is Aldous Huxley. <laughs> Of, uh, of Brave New World fame. Um, he, he wrote this quote. It goes like this. He's talking about having a psychedelic mystic experience. Um, he says, I, find, I found myself all at once on the brink of panic. This, I suddenly felt, was going too far. Too far, even, th even though the going was into intenser beauty, deeper significance. The fear, as I analyze it in retrospect, was of being overwhelmed or disintegrated under a pressure of reality that a mind could possibly bear. So that's Daniel standing in Scotland at the edge of the uh, at the edge of the uh, rocky uh, beach with the uh, looking out into the eternity of the ocean. It's you at the coral reef. It's me. <laughs> it's me at the coral reef. Yeah. What more could you hope for? Yeah.